Hi, everyone. My name is Gretchen Rowe, and I'm so delighted to welcome you to this presentation today. We have done so much work, and I have to tell you, the more we learn, the more we want to share. And I am absolutely delighted to have the opportunity to have my colleague Sue Wachter join me. Sue and I have been partners in crime here at Demi Learning for eight and a half years. And we learn from the families with whom we engage. So I'm going to let Sue introduce herself. Hi, my name is Sue Wachter. And I just noticed I should have straightened all my pictures in the back, but that's um, how it goes. <laughs> like I should have done that before we started. But anyway, I. Um, but that's I, a true artist, Sue. So <laughs> yeah. yeah, get them on the wall. Don't worry about getting them straight. So anyway, um, I have been um, enjoying art since my son um, took an art class in college. So before then, I always thought about someday I'm going to do art, but didn't start till then. He um, came home from his art class and he said, Mom, Mom, let's, let's do art together. And so he showed me his project and it was just splashing paint and making messes, which was so much fun. And here my college age student and I were having this great time doing art. And so that's where it all started for me. I, it wasn't like I drew things all my life. Um, we had artists in the family. So, you know, that, that was a big, you know, that can be a problem because you have artists in the family. So surely you're not an artist. So. Um, that's a big mistake to think that way. So I started taking art classes um, because it was so exciting, not only exciting to see what I could do, but realizing the social part of the art, doing it with someone else, having fun doing art was, was such a joy. And so then I realized too, right away that um, every time I come from home from a art class, I would invite my friends over and I would teach them because I realized that when I taught, I integrated it better. So um, they got the benefit of me teaching them, but I also became a better artist because I taught and I taught from the beginning. And I was very, very new to art before I started teaching at the local community college. I just sent in my resume. I'm good at making resumes. And they said, hey, we have some continuing ed classes coming up. Would like to have you on the roster. And it started from there. So I will tell you the most important part, whether you're the teacher or the student, is that teach back idea, the idea of preparing to teach, whether it's math or art, is so powerful. It's just, I, I just can't express that enough. One of the things that sets Demi apart from other mathematics curricula is the fact that that teach back is a critical, integral part of our mathematical process. How do you know your student understands? Because your student is going to explain their understanding to you, and that makes an enormous amount of difference. And I think one of the things that's important as we dig into this topic is we as homeschool parents make the misapprehension that if we have an artistic child, maybe they are not mathematically oriented. I say they're two sides of the same coin. Sue says they're twins. And both of them are important. And I think a lot of what you're going to learn today is how do you set expectations for that artsy kid who says, I hate math? And reframe it in, here's an opportunity for math because it's going to make you a better artist. So I'm really excited before we get into this today um, to also let you know that Sue has a background of working with homeschoolers for, what is it now, Sue, 35 years? 1988 is when I first had a store and began working with homeschool families. So a long time. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. So, um, Sue, you said that there's a saying that uh, once someone um, that goes like this, if you ask a group of kindergarten students to raise their hand, they're all artists. And second grade, you'll have fewer who raise their hands. And the older we get, the less we think of ourselves as an artist. So as parents, 
who are trying to foster that math and art connection. How do we have that conversation with our kids? Well, part of it is, it goes back to um, it, I, there, this wasn't the order that I was thinking of, but the first thing that came to my mind was perfectionism. Um, and allowing uh, how you view their art, um, how you honor their art, how you don't let people critique their art, <laughs> um, those types of things. Unless they're going to do it positively. Unless they're going to do it positively, but negative critiques, um, make sure you avoid that. Um, also helping them not be harsh critiques of themselves, comparing themselves to others. Again, that so-and-so is the artist in the family. So they look at that and say, okay, so my art needs to look like that. Not realizing that art is a process, just like anything, any other learning. So um, those are the things. And then the other thing too is it's interesting when I'm, I've taught art camps and that type of thing. I have to really express to the parents that when they take these pieces of art home, treat them like art. They don't belong on the refrigerator. Um, they might go in the child's room if the child really wants them in the room. But I really encourage you to have an area in your home that they, you put their art that's out there with your decor. It's out there treated like art. That's why probably the number one thing I would have you um, do is whenever they sit down to work on a piece of art, make sure that paper or that, especially we're going to be talking about visual painting and stuff the most, not other art today, but um, same thing works. Make sure that paper that they're working on or that canvas will fit in a standard mat or frame because otherwise you're not gonna hang it correctly. Um, presentation is everything. It needs to be presented correctly. Or they, they will do a piece of art that is the wrong size to fit the standard frame or mat. And you, you're not going to pay $100 to have that matted and framed. So unfortunately, every tablet that you get, art tablet that you get, comes with the wrong size paper. So um, I always cut everything down to size when I'm working with my grandkids because I want to assume that I'm going to be hanging it on the wall. Everything they do, I assume it's going to become a piece of art. Does it always? No. But then you're ready to go. You just pop it in the frame. You could even have a gallery area in your living area um, for the family art. And then if you have those same sizes as a piece of paper, you can switch them out. So I got a little digress, but that's a hot item for me. But it's all about treating the students um, art like art. And I think that makes the difference. Now, you said something, Sue, in, in that explanation that I think is really important. And that is that an artist doesn't arrive full blown. Oh, ta -da. You have to learn and you have to cultivate that craft. And math is the same way. So can you, because I've heard you have this conversation with families so often, can you draw those parallels for parents who are sometimes frustrated with their artistic child who's doodling all over the page instead of actually doing the math? Right. Well, if they're only doodling, that's a problem. But the doodling also is a quick break and bring me back to what you wanted me to talk about, but that just sprung bore me into something else. So when I'm teaching art classes, um, I've started doing, and um, some students love it, some students don't. Um, I've started um, having them doing quick, quick paints or quick sketches. And so um, you only have two or three minutes to get something done and you, um, you just, you don't think, you just do it. And those are important because you learn so much and you you actually will end up with a nice little piece of art. It's it's amazing. 
So anyway, having them doing a little quick sketch to start your math um, isn't a bad idea. It kind of gets them to relax and, and feel good about the moment. And um, so, so then when they're done too, then, um, or if they need a break, just give them a little. So if, during our classes, like last night, it was a project class. So those are pretty intense, um, an art class that I was teaching. And so we took quick breaks. So I also do it along with them because one of the things as a teacher I do, it's important that you share your mistakes and your um, bravery and your things that don't turn out too. I don't have any problem with that. I don't have to fake it because if you're an artist, you are making mistakes all the time. That's what you do. And that's your best learning tool. So here was my little, one of our quick sketches was a little bat. So here's my little bat that I did in just a few minutes. And everybody did amazing little pictures. Now, I'll be honest, I couldn't remember what a bat looked like, even though that was my idea to do a bat. So mine looked more like a butterfly. So luckily, I used the right paint and I got rid of it after I saw everybody else's. So again, that learning from each other and having fun and taking risks in front of each other is an important element of the art. Um, that's why I love teaching watercolor because we do five or six paintings in a two hour session typically so that everybody, literally everybody walks away with something frameable. So, and you know what? I think that also makes a difference for students, because often parents will tell us kids are very resistant to begin math because they don't want to do it wrong. Um, there is that element of perfectionism um, that, uh, frankly, we breed it into our kids um, because we might have demonstrated it in front of them. Um, and actually, in the spring, we're going to do a webinar talking about how do you step away from perfectionism in front of your children to um, make it. Um, less desirable so that they can fail. And I, I say that because it's really important for you to understand that in mathematics, the learning does not happen with what you get right. The learning happens with what you get wrong and are willing to work through to correct. And Sue, I know that you um, draw this parallel for parents. I've heard you uh, speak at conferences about this of um, helping kids reframe what they're doing mathematically so that they see um, their efforts um, affirmatively. Just like you don't start with a perfect design, you might not start with a perfect math problem either. So often, um, especially with a parent of an artsy student, they'll say, okay, so the student's struggling with word problems. So you say, okay, so I'm going to read this word problem and tell me what you see. Okay, so the word problem is Sally had three apples and she found five more. How many does she have? Well, some of you will say, well, when I just see, you know, how many does say five? Five apples. I just see five apples. Oh, well, you start that, you might springboard or trigger those of us that are artists, it's a sunny day and um, Sally has little pigtails, that'd be cute. And you could just do her back so that you have to worry about all the face stuff. And, and then you can, um, there would be apple trees and I think it'd be cute too if you just had the grass coming up around. So you see what I mean? You have to be careful how you frame having them visualize the word problem. So that's why I love the Matthew C. Blocks, because if you have them um, build the word problems with the blocks, say, how would you build them with the, this word problem with the blocks? You will click them over to the left part of the brain where they're going to still have their creative visual thing going on, but they're going to see the blocks rather than the scene. I mean, to literally tell you how this works, um, the spelling you see, I decided one time to, um, and I'm not getting into spelling, but this gives you an example of as an adult, 
how that can trigger, especially if you're a creative thinker. I said, I should do one of the spelling you see lessons just to see what it's like. So I got the book out and I just happened to open it to um, the spelling lesson on an artist. Well, that was obviously going to be interesting. Well, this particular artist hid their name in all of their paintings. So here I'm supposed to be working on spelling, right? And I literally got up and I went and looked at some of my paintings. How could I possibly hide my, it's like, Sue, you're trying to do spelling. So just remember, especially if you've got a creative thinker and it doesn't have to be a drawer, they could just be, they could, they could be good at storytelling, whatever, but their, their mind is very creative orientated. You have to be careful what you ask for. And um, so you, that restructuring of how you say things, you have to be careful not to trigger um, a creative moment where they just want to grab their. Or the other thing you can do is let the creative moment happen and say, well, tell me, what is that? What do you envision? Well, I envisioned the little girl with pigtails, et cetera, et cetera. Perfect. We're going to come back to that later. Let's step back into the math. Do you see how we're framing the conversation for you all affirmatively so that you can speak to your child as they experience things without making it wrong, but you're helping re-guide them or reorient them to keep them on track. I know sometimes as a parent, and I have been that parent, my, my thought is you're really doing this to just drive me nuts. And that's not really <laughs> the case at all. Their brains are just oriented differently. And so right. we have to be able to make that happen for them. So this was another class. This was a very beginner, beginner adult class. And we did the pumpkins and they had like a short amount of time. I don't remember, two or three minutes. Both of those students, those are just adorable little pumpkins. And look at the skill. Look at the how they let the watercolor dance. They did everything teacher told them to do. And they were just delightful little paintings. These were just little outtakes, quick things. Both of those students would not take those home. They said they were not good enough. To me as a teacher, that is heartbreaking. I could not throw those in the garbage. They're absolutely, I mean, look at those. Look at the paint. They let it move. Oh, I just could go on and on how awesome those little paintings are. So that's important too, even for your art student. And the reason I talk about that is because often art students are very critical of their work, extremely critical of their work. Um, I have had um, art students, I, you know, I know that they have their little, they have their little journal with their all their little sketches and all that stuff. And I said, oh, can I see your work? And they go, oh, oh, it's just, oh, no, it's, it's not good enough. It's not very good. And they open it up and it's like way beyond what I could do way beyond, but they're just nothing but critical because of that perfection thing. There, there's some standard that they think that they have to reach to be good at it. And, and that's just tragic. So I just, if you have art students that are doing that, I, I'm not sure what the answer is, but it has something to do with perfectionism. And it, chances are, if they're also struggling in math, it's the perfectionism that's causing the problem, not the math. And so if you see those two things together, and I have talked to parents often on the phone and they're talking about their students and then I'll suddenly say, that I'm getting some clues that they could be artsy. I'll say, Do you, you're your student kind of artsy? Oh yeah, art all the time. And then I'll ask, in their art, is there perfectionism going on there? And not always. I'm not saying this is always, but sometimes it is. And that's something that you want to stay aware of, um, that that's a totally different issue. And then the fun thing is I'll say, so the mom, I'll say, so how are you on art? Oh, well, I'm not an artist at all. And it's like, have you considered having your student teach you art? Again, the teach back. Again, you can model to them how to learn when you think 
you're not good enough. Because that not good enough thing is a destroyer of art and math. It just are you getting the impression from us that we want to raise your consciousness as parents so that you can make different decisions with your students as far as math and art is concerned. One of the things I think that I have learned um, uh, at studying at Sue's shoulder, if you will, over the years is when a parent says, oh, my child is very artsy, they're not very good at math, we would like you to change that. Um, because what Sue says is, oh, they're very artsy, then they are going to be terrific at math as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is a really important takeaway for us to learn as parents. I believed you could either do one or the other. And it wasn't until Sue came into my life in 2014 that I realized that not only could you do both, but you can take the skills of one set of opportunities and parlay them into skills in the other set of our opportunities. So Sue, I know that you had talked about um, using math words in art yes. context. So can you um, explain a little bit more in depth about right. that? Right, and, and I would be careful with this. I wouldn't overdo it. You don't wanna ruin the art by making it too mathy. When you're teaching art concepts, and, and trust me, if you came out and said, okay, I'm going to teach you and we're going to do this where it's a more of a structured, it's not as a creative art lesson, they are going to shut down on you so fast, just like they do with the math. Guarantee you, when I teach kids, I give about 10 minutes of instruction. I say, look, I'm going to give you 10 minutes of instruction. I'm going to want you to listen. And after that, you're cut loose in the studio. You just go out and discover because they can only handle, even in art, just so much instruction on what they do not yet know. And that's things that are very specific. So like math is also very specific. And so when they're learning something new, whether it is in art or math, you don't recognize it in art because they're off doing it all the time on their own, but the same thing will happen. You want to limit the time and not go past the shutdown. Now, it's a little harder to figure out how to make math be discovery, but um, why not work a little bit on that new concept and say, okay, think of it, math stuff is easy for you and I'll give you a sheet of that to do. So that they had their time of intense instruction, you kept it brief before they shut down on you and then you somehow turned them loose. But you wouldn't think you'd say, oh, no, they could take. No, I guarantee you, I've taught kids enough. You can only give them a little bit of intense instruction. But the beauty is over time, you will see that instruction, that art instruction that's very specific and very skill driven creep into their work. And it's wonderful to see. And they do it on their own and they do it in their discovery. They don't do it. And then it all comes together. But also having, having, so I'll circle back to what you said. I'm sorry, I just get so excited and get sidetracked. I'll circle back to what you said. During that instruction, use the word parallel. Use the word rectangle. Use the word perpendicular. Use those words. Um, you can even, you know, perspective, all that stuff. Use that in your brief instruction. Those are math things. It will implement into their art over time, not immediately. You know, don't make them sit there and make them do for, you know, an hour. Or have them have a art project that they only work on it in small bits. So that, um, and it is more instructed, but they're only allowed 10 minutes on it. Now, if they want to go into their discovery mode and, and continue with it, but this is a project, this is separate, that can make a difference as well. I hope I'm making sense out there. So there is art things that they will be resistant to. Trust me, I've seen it. I've tried to, at the beginning, I tried to teach art where they were taught like adults, this is how you do it. 
um, and make them hang in there with me for an hour. It does not work. They shut down, they melt down, they just trash it, okay? Um, you could have a student that doesn't do that, but that's been the norm that I have seen. Uh, so it's the same as math. So how they learn, how you see them learn and develop in art is the same way they're gonna develop and learn in math. So it may be different than another child that learns a different way. Um, one thing too, some of us, many of us who are artists hate redundance. We just like, why? I mean, I know how to do it. Why do I have to do that whole math sheet? And, and they're right. I mean, if they know how to do it, do they need to do 30 of them? I mean, really? Now we could probably have a debate over that, some of us, but um, the, the whole idea is to learn. And if they can learn in less, doing less or picking every other one or pick the ones they they like the looks of or whatever. Um, but I wanna right. circle back around Sue to what you said at the very beginning that the way in which we make that happen is for them to teach you that they know what they're doing. Correct, correct. Because if they don't know how to do it anyway, to do a whole page wrong isn't gonna help. It's actually gonna Absolutely. do more damage. So Absolutely. I'm glad you brought that up because that's real. I know, I know you made you make this because um, Sue is one of our upper level support specialists. So you may call in and say, I need help with Algebra 1 and you may get the opportunity to talk to Sue. And one of the things that she says is, particularly when you're looking at upper level mathematics, you want to make sure that you're working through and you understand what you're doing before you're doing all of it. And that really applies to any level of math. So this mm -hmm. is where you as the parent need to come alongside your student before you send them off. Who wants to do a page of math if yesterday I did a page of math and then you told me everything was wrong? Mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to do that. I wouldn't. And sometimes as parents, you know, we get involved in the busyness of our day and we forget that there is virtue in our being able to um, make sure they're doing it properly from the beginning. Um, Sue, I know that you set some parameters around that for kids um, as far as their being able to understand um, that they're not going to get it right the first time. And I wonder if you could um, reimagine that conversation that you have perhaps with a student who is in more complex mathematics and is frustrated, um, particularly the story you tell about Algebra 1. Um, I that you just think you're talking the about the young man that called in. Yes. Yes. Okay. So this young man called in and he, he said, I'm having trouble. We were on speakerphone. So just so you know, we're very careful that we aren't having private conversations with your kids. So they were on speakerphone and uh, it's always fun to do speakerphone anyway, because the kids often end up teaching the parent right in front of me. But anyway, this, this kid called in and he said, oh, this lesson is all messed up. He goes, I, it just isn't making any sense of, to me. And so I said, so when did you watch the video? He goes, just today. I said, you do know that you're not supposed to know everything today? He goes, what? I said, no, this is where you're learning. These pages, these practice pages or for practice. So you try one of the problems. If it isn't making sense, go look at the answer key. See if that gives you any clues. Go look back at the video or just shut the book because you might not be going to get it today. I said, do not waste that worksheet doing it all wrong. I said, it's about learning. You're in Algebra 1. You're not supposed to know everything immediately just because the guy on the video said so. And the mom got on the phone. And she goes, wow. She goes, that, that made a difference. She goes, we didn't know that. He was beating himself up because he'd watched a 10-minute video and didn't know how to do algebra. And, and that doesn't even... I mean, that's algebra, but it could be at a lower level too. So if your child, again, watch that clock, make sure you're not saying, come on, we got to get this worksheet done. We don't have to get the worksheet done. We are learning, especially at the beginning, that 
make sure you don't drag that student out for an hour. Don't even drag them out sometimes more than 10 or 15 minutes. And we always say around here, it's their age plus two or three. Is that what we say now? We used to say two. So if you have an eight-year-old, you've got about 10 minutes of full attention span when they're learning something new. It's not about finishing the page. And again, now, I do add a caveat to that. And I say, if you have a child who's in puberty, you need to subtract two to three minutes from their age <laughs> <laughs> because the nature of puberty means that they are distractible. Um, but I think all of this, everything we have talked about is being careful to frame expectations accordingly. Don't let your kids say they can't. Say, you just haven't managed it yet. I love the way Sue says this is, you don't have, there's no expectation that you have a full understanding the very first day. And sometimes the best thing to do is to close the book and walk away and wait for the next day, or even an hour later, mm -hmm. you might have a greater understanding than you did at that very first viewing. It makes a lot of difference for kids. So we had so many parents who ask so many questions. And um, I, I wanna make sure that since we're at the bottom of the hour, we start heading toward these questions. Okay. Um, I ha had a parent who said that she said she's looking for the best approach for a seven-year-old who's very creative, but struggling with math. And what are the, if you have a, a placement conversation with a parent as a placement specialist at Demi, what are the kinds of questions you are asking that parent to determine where the struggle is? Well, my number one thing with a seven-year-old is going to be, um, do they have their facts fluent that they've studied. That's the number one thing. That is, we talk about tools, addition, subtraction. Those are your basic tools that you really need to have without counting. Because what happens is you can might slide them along. You might give them a, a number line. You might give them a, a trick or teach them to count on their fingers or whatever. And they might be able to get through alpha. They might be, may able, be able to get through multi-digit addition and subtraction. Sometimes multiplication comes together, but what we find consistently is the wheels will fall off in long division. That's when the wheels fall off. And the sad thing is, is you didn't take the time to get those tools in first grade. So now you have to take them back. And it's not a bad thing and it does make a big difference, but it's better to deal with it now. Don't worry about, did we get through the book? Worry about, did we get done with those basic tools? Did we get those basic tools mastered? And that's why Math UC is such a great program because we help them do that by using them again, those manipulative blocks. So they, we immediately take them once they know how to count, we take them away from counting single things to what color are you going to put up? Uh, our favorite color, purple. Oh, purple, okay. That will help them so that then they can visualize again, especially a creative child, those blocks aren't going to stay out here on the table. Those blocks are going to be in their head. And just like the finger counting may not always be out here, but they're still going to be finger counting in their head so that if they can see a six and a four makes a 10 in their head, they can quickly get to that answer without counting. And that's why it's so important to do the build, write, and save part of that. Um, and, but a lot of curriculums do teach them to count. They just teach them to count. And then long division, that's where you lose a lot of students. That's, that's where all of a sudden the math be game becomes hard. And we think that children have a math deficiency. And what they don't is, what they have instead is they're trying to drive a car that has flat tires. Mm -hmm. So we want to put the air back in their tires. And the way in which we do that is by reinforcing those facts and helping them move along a continuum so that they have that knowledge ingrained in their head so that when you ask them a question, two plus four, they say six, they don't count to get there. So I wonder if, since we were integral in the development of aim for addition and subtraction and aim for multiplication, there's an art element, if you will, 
in AIM, when we utilize the pencils to ask the kids to show us what's in their head. And I wonder if you could talk about why that's important because that's how we get away from this right. part. So we've added, so, so those of you that have used Alpha and have, haven't used AIM, you'll, you, you'll say, what is she talking about? But we, um, we added the draw, write and say. So what we do is they first learn to build, write and say, and then we help them visualize it in their head by taking the colored pencils and drawing a blue line and a pink line and then a brown line. So to make three, five plus three equals eight. Okay, so they have to see the blocks in their head, in that creative part of their brain that they store all their photo images of what they draw. We get the blocks in there. That's that's what we need to do. And then they translate that with the colored pencils so that they we see that they can visualize it and actually see it. And draw. So Sue, I'm going to now ask you a question about an older student because we had a mom who said she has a 15 year old who's struggling with math and is very inclined toward art. And if we had that conversation as far as placement is concerned with that family, what are the questions you would be asking? Well, the number one thing with a 15 year old, if their facts are memorized and and sometimes they aren't, and that's where we're at. So we could have in AIM, we could have anybody from an eight-year-old to a 16-year-old is not unusual at all. However, the other piece is the fractions. That's the number one thing in an older student because you don't realize that fractions uh, are integral to understand. Inside. We aren't making pizza, cutting pizza anymore. We're actually using fractions to manipulate numbers and and find solutions. And it's not always going to be a fraction. So it's not like when you're learning fractions where it's just handed to you and you say, do this fraction problem. You have to know when to use the fraction to solve the equation. So a lot of times in, um, in a lot of curriculums, they learn the formula. So the thing is the formulas are so simple. And I'll say this to parents all the time and say, yep, that's exactly what's happening. They'll say, oh, remind me how to add fractions. And the parent gives them the quick reminder and they get the whole page done and they forget it, okay? So not only do they not remember the formula, they don't even know what the fractions are doing. They're just, I mean, they're kids. They're just getting the work done. That's what the goal is, get it done. And, and you as the parent are their rememory, if you will. Yes, <laughs> and parents will say, yeah, that's what happens. They can do fractions if... So sometimes you have to go back and redo the fractions and it's not going to take a whole year. But again, with Matthew C, we're using visual fraction overlays so they can see what is happening with the fractions so then they can understand how to use it. Um, and they will also remember it. Like the one that I always think of for myself is area of a trapezoid. Like I, I don't remember formulas worth, I, I can't remember formulas. <laughs> But I just quickly do the visual of the blocks in my head and I can solve it. And so that was really an aha moment for me because then it's like, oh, that's how that's how this stuff works. I've been selling. I actually experienced myself. And then in Algebra 1, I never, um, they didn't put me in Algebra 1. In those days, if you couldn't pass pre-algebra, they put you in this other basic math and said you were hopeless. And so... Um, I learned Algebra 1 here working at Demi Learning. And that's where I really realized the whole, I applied the way I learned my art to my math and it worked. It worked. So figuring out how your student learns their art and applying it to how you expect them to learn their math will make a big difference. And then I got to see doing slope and intercept oh my goodness, this is art. I mean, this is perspective. This is all kinds of art right here. Um, it isn't just about numbers. So as an aside, the fact that Sue gets excited about algebra to me is still amusing and funny. I'm 
still not excited about algebra, despite the fact that I've been here at Demi for eight and a half years. <laughs> um, but the thing I think that's important here is, um, and the message I want you as parents to capture is, you can learn no matter what age you are to be enthusiastic about something. You just, like Sue said, need the right tools. So that your, your um, visualization of the area of a trapezoid, I want to take that one step further now and answer a question that a parent asked. And it was, what sorts of activities can I do with my students to help them see how math is applied in beautiful and useful ways? And so in, in your answer, remember the summer that you had the art journal where you made people go out and find angles and you made people go out and find Fibonacci sequences and things like that. Can you explain in a little bit of depth why that's beneficial? Well, I think you're talking about the John Muir Laws Nature Journal group. Yes. That is, um, and they have a full curriculum there. I would use the um, Nature Journal Connection. That's the one that I used. And we would, uh, we would have homework to do that you had to watch the video before you went out, um, join the group. And so you'd watch the video and some of us didn't always watch the video. And so then someone had to teach us. So we just gave them a bonus, right? Um, they had to teach it back to us. And, but there was so much math involved. I mean, there's one where you, you can, you can pretty much tell how tall a tree is by doing this mathematical, take so many steps out and stop and measure and look and, without even using a measurement. I mean, it's fascinating. And um, the Fibonacci's are everywhere. Gretchen and I have gone on Fibonacci watches, walks when we were in California working together. Um, and they're fascinating to see those um, everywhere you go, especially in California, but Fibonacci's are everywhere. So look it up and start looking for them. But it goes back to, just in the world around you to look beyond the obvious and just think for your math student as you're developing this ability to look beyond the obvious that will just like discovery will start coming into other parts of your life um i the john muir laws has really set me off i mean i can't even walk outside anymore without stopping and saying what birds are tweeting i mean I mean, it's crazy. Yes, you end up being the crazy lady, but um, but just being more aware, you know, we're so busy, we're hopping in the car, we're running here and there, but taking those moments to see what's really there. What color are the clouds really? Another one is what color is the pavement today? You go, was well, she crazy? It's gray. No, it's not always gray. Looking beyond, what color is a blackbird? Anytime a blackbird jumps in front of me in the parking lot at the store, I stop and look what color he is. And he's not just black. But and I think one of the things that is very intentional about what Sue is describing here is you can take those skills of observation back into the classroom and apply them not just in mathematics, but in any opportunity that you have for academics because our goal here is to educate the whole child correct we want to raise children to be contributing members of adult society and if my husband was saying that sentence he would have the caveat that says who don't live with us and so <laughs> the goal is to help our kids begin to observe the world in a way that helps them function and navigate and enjoy the world more thoroughly. Mm -hmm. So, so many of our parents said that they were trying to figure out um, ways to assess a student's aptitude for art. And um, I know that you teach a lot of classes in the summertime to younger students. And the interesting thing of, I find fascinating about your classes is you don't teach to an age, you teach to an idea. So can you talk a little bit about teaching to an idea? 
Right. So when I'm working with kids, I teach adult level art. Now, yes, I might have to be a little more aware of attention span and cut them off and let them go into discovery earlier. For one thing, you have to give them good tools. Like I don't bring the cheap stuff. Now I'm not saying run out and buy a bunch of expensive stuff. Um, but as they learn and grow to respect the tools, get them the good stuff, get them the better stuff. So many of our parents said, you know, I have kids who just absolutely um, love art and they hate math. And I think one of the things that we can do here for the parents in the closing 10 minutes is, um, Sue, you're, you're good at helping parents reframe those conversations with their kids. And so I wonder if you could help parents understand how reframing the conversations would be to their advantage. So there are things like the one that I think of often, and, and I've used this, is, um, again, using the vocabulary, but I did this with a little homeschool group that I was working with, and we learned making ribbon banners. We, you could talk about middle and, and make it part of your art lesson. And so, or not your art lesson, your math lesson. Like what I did was I said, now when you go home at the top of your math paper, you put this little banner and you put your name in it. That's how you're going to put your name in. And a little girl came back the next door. She goes, I did it. I, I'm my math paper. I, so anyway, but we talked about parallel lines and halfway and then halfway and, and make it triangle here. Um, so as you see that ribbon um, lesson, start out with the straight one. Then you can get fancy with the curves and the perspective and all that. But try to use the right verbiage and say, this is math. This is when you, this is what's going to make it all worth it. I, it's not fun learning your math facts and all this stuff, but when you grow up, you're going to be using math to be building and creating things because nobody's going to pay you to do a math worksheet. You're going to, what are you going to do with math when you're done? You're going to go out there and create things and tell about things and describe things using math. Um, so try to make that connection in little ways and have it part of their math. Um, but the ribbon banners are, are a fun way to do it and try to use, and unfortunately, a lot of the ribbon banner show you how to do it, but you'll be able to see it's a rectangle. And then when you do the ribbon that has the curve, then you talk about it being an arc. This is an arc. So use those words to describe the lines. Um, I think Melissa has given us a great quote here. She says her favorite John Muir quote, uh, one that she's always loved is tug on anything at all and find it connected to everything in the universe. Oh, and I think that a, is really that one, that's, terrific. And that's much what you were saying. You know, blackbirds aren't really black. What does a blackbird sound like? you know, those kinds of things. And here's in the last couple of minutes, Sue, I would like us to talk a little bit about um, not all academics are done with a pen and a piece of paper. And um, I know that you have had the opportunity to do some amazing learning experiences with your grandchildren. So can you talk about particularly if you have a child who really is resistant to, I um, don't want to sit here for four hours and do schoolwork. Can you talk about how you can take school into the universe so that um, that is a more profitable experience? So I always treasure hunt. And so they know that if they go with grandma, we've got to go look for treasures. And so um, we really got into it. And then there were these dead jellyfish all over and and so um, I know some people don't like to pick them up, but we picked them up because we wanted to take them back to the campgrounds and wash them off so we could just see what they looked like. And so then at the end of the camping trip, um, so we're doing all this stuff and we're finding dead snakes and we're looking close. I mean, that's just the best. That's just so much fun. So again, discovery, noticing things, noticing details. 
um, looking at those jellyfish, looking them up online. This is how they look live. And oh my goodness, it was so much fun. So we're, we, I couldn't leave the jellyfish at the camp in the bucket of water. So I, as we're getting ready to go, I said, let's go down to the beach and let the jellyfish, the dead jellyfish go. And so, um, and my, then my grandson yeah. goes, well, what's going to happen to them out there? I said, well, probably some of the other animals will eat them. It's like, I probably shouldn't have said that, but I mean, it's the truth. And so um, anyway, so we're coming over. So here were three other kids and my grandson were coming over the ridge here and to go down to the beach and right in front of us, right in front of us, there's this eagle chasing a seagull like we could see it right there and everybody stopped like I think because we'd spent so much time exploring we didn't want to miss it and everybody just was speechless and it was luckily that didn't catch it or kill it in front of us or anything but it was just the epitome of that whole looking beyond the obvious looking don't miss stuff I mean, we miss so much stuff, but again, how does that fit, fit in with math? It does, because then when you begin to look beyond the obvious in the world, you can start to see beyond the obvious in the math because you're used to looking. I think that is probably the, um, the best phrase that you have said is when you look beyond the obvious in the world, you learn to look beyond the obvious in the math as well. And that really is a true statement. Um, I think as a parent of very art-oriented children, I always felt like um, math came in second place to them. And um, being able to reframe those conversations now, I am amazed at some of those art-oriented kids who now have jobs in very math-centric professions. Mm -hmm. And they have found that, yes, you do need math in the adult world, particularly if you're in graphic design and typography and web design. And um, it's amazing how those applications come back to bless us. So the, if you take nothing else away from our conversation today, I want you to take away the fact that you as the parent are in the driver's seat as far as creating a learning environment that is encouraging. And it should include both math and art. And there should never be an environment where one is exclusive of the other. So we're at the top of the hour. It's gone too fast because we had so many notes we didn't even get to. So, so what are the closing comments you'd like? For well, our first of all, we, we probably fire hosed you. So the thing I tell my students in, um, in my art classes, if you come away with one piece, one piece that you feel you can integrate or half of a piece, we have been a success. We have been a success because you can't just like they can't get all that math all at once. You can't get all that we talked about all at once, it, it, especially if it's something new to you. So allow yourself that. Don't be overwhelmed by that. Read the blog. There's some tips there. Pick one of them. And if you're still not sure what to do, um, contact me, but be ready. I'll have questions first because it isn't a one size fits all. That's what's important. So see, the blog you're talking about, it came out last Friday mm -hmm. and it's called the math and art connection. I think do so. I have that right. I, I believe think that's so. the name of the blog. If you found merit in our conversation today and we touched on doodling, we have a webinar that we did in the spring on math doodling, and there's a blog that accompanies that event as well. Don't let this be the end of your conversation with your student. Go and find those resources at demilearning.com slash blog. You can find all the webinars that we have produced this year. You can find a thriving blog um, environment to learn more and dig deeper and Thank you so much, Sue, for your time today. I would be remiss if I didn't say in closing that there's not just one kind of art. If you look behind Sue, I think that there are four different kinds of art. And 
The scarf that hangs around her neck is some of her artwork as well. The example that I want to leave you with here is there's more than one way to accomplish something. And if you have a student who is creative in their enterprises, don't assume that they're not also math oriented. Leonardo da Vinci was one of the most brilliant mathematicians and he was also an incredible artist. Foster both of those skills in your students because I think you'll be glad you did. Sue, any closing words? I just wanted to say this, this painting here is my granddaughter when she was two. So here's another secret if you got little ones. And I could talk for another hour, but that's okay. Um, grab it away from them before they ruin it. That's the secret. <laughs> so you watch their art. You say, oh, that looks great. Here, here's another piece of paper. Yeah, that's how you get the good stuff. Anyway, it's been fun. And I literally could go on and on and on because um, between math and art, those are my two best things to talk about. Take care, everyone. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Goodbye.